I'm Chief Petty Officer Herb Josie. This week on Navy Marine Corps News, the Chief of Naval Operations visits sailors in the southeast. Marines in Okinawa make the most out of realistic training. And sailors and scientists prepare to go under the ice on their way to the North Pole. Join me and Corporal Christiana Halsey for these stories and more on Navy Marine Corps News. This week on Navy Marine Corps News, the Chief of Naval Operations visits sailors in the southeast. Marines in Okinawa make the most out of realistic training, and sailors and scientists prepare to go under the ice on their way to the North Pole. Stay tuned for these stories and more next on Navy Marine Corps News. Welcome to Navy Marine Corps News. I'm Chief Petty Officer Herb Josie. And I'm Corporal Chris John Halsey. Chief, it's great to have you back. You look a lot better. Ah, uh, thanks. I feel better, too, uh, for everybody out there. I broke my nose a couple of weeks ago, and I had to have some surgery last week to put it back in its proper place on my face. Uh, after a little recovery time, though, I was able to get back on the road with the Chief of Naval Operations. He took a trip down to Jacksonville, Florida, and a couple of bases in Texas to talk and meet with sailors in the Sun Belt. Somehow it's only fitting that in Texas, the Navy's biggest admiral wears a big hat. This Navy League dinner honored Corpus Christi Sailor and Officer of the Year, and it was just one stop of many during Admiral Borda's busy two days in Texas. The CNO talked to sailors at Naval Air Station's Kingsville, Corpus Christi, and Dallas. He answered questions from both sailors and reporters, and he got in a couple of jump shots while there, re-enlisted a bunch of sailors, and even commissioned a new ensign. I have to make sure this is the first time he's had all this stuff on. He hasn't tried it to see how it works. <laughs> At NAS Kingsville, Admiral Borda got to land an F-A-18 on an aircraft carrier in the simulator. Boy, oh, that's so realistic, I got ready for that. The CNO also got out into the community, touring the ballpark in Arlington, home of the Texas Rangers, and he met with community leaders, most notably Texas Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. And he wrapped up his Grand Texas tour at the Dallas Military Ball with a speech in front of a thousand people. Admiral Borda also spent a day in Jacksonville, Florida. He had good news for helicopter pilots at the Naval Helicopter Association Symposium. I think that we need to move further and further in the direction of arming you better so that you can be even more potent as you do your job. At three all-hands calls at NAS Jacksonville and Cecil Field, well-informed sailors asked the CNO questions about the hottest issues in the Navy today, like the new evaluation system. The Navy Times had reported that you were going to make a decision by the end of March when we would implement that. Has that decision been made? Uh, Navy Times is reporting that accurately because I told Navy Times that. And um, I have not made the decision, but I will before the end of March. And women aboard USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. I've heard a lot of negative things about it, and I wanted to know if there's anything positive coming out of women on ships. There is no news and people doing what they're supposed to do, which is what most of us do every day. We don't do sensational things. We get up and do the job. This nervous petty officer needed the CNO's help to ask her question about child care. You have a soft voice. Okay. You even wrote down, I am Petty Officer Hall. You knew that without this. <laughs> Through the laughs and the good rapport he has with sailors, Admiral Board has got a simple message. Sailors' concerns are important because sailors are the most important part of the Navy. It looked like the CNO had a lot of fun on that trip. Oh, he met a lot of people and had a great time while he was out there. He also focused on reservists at Naval Air Station Dallas. They were very happy to see him. Well, speaking of reservists, throughout the Navy, reservists are becoming more involved with active duty personnel. And as Petty Officer Mark Kane reports, their unique skills and experience only serve to make an already great Navy even better. You may think of them as just part-timers, but the fact is, reservists are hard at work every day making major contributions to the Navy's mission. 
Just take a look at Desert Storm. A lot of squadrons uh, took up for the active duty squadrons, a lot of reserve squadrons during the war. So it's like, you know, we can do it when our big brothers need, uh, need to be out there, we'll take over. We had reservists flying fighter aircraft and, and flying A-10s and shooting up the ground. All services, active and reserve components, and I think everybody would agree with me, all my fellow service chiefs, we are in fact one team. And a big part of the team is the 18-ship Naval Surface Reserve Force. The newest member of that force is USS John F. Kennedy, the only aircraft carrier in the reserve fleet. The Kennedy will be a full up round, a fully operational carrier uh, available in both peace and crisis to deploy and, and do whatever operations called upon. 600 reservists will be attached to that carrier. Part of the crew will participate the full time support on a daily basis operating with the crew and the selected reservists during their annual training periods. Another example of the impact reserves have on the Navy's mission is the recent return of Fleet Hospital 5 from Zagreb, Croatia. A largely reserve command made the flight arrangements to get the hospital staff back to the states. That's the job of Naval Air Logistics Command in New Orleans, to make sure the fleet gets from point A to point B, no matter what. Z, arriving into Norfolk at 2100Z. 85% of everything that those 13 squadrons uh, do on a daily basis are uh, directed towards airlifting active Navy requirements. So we're very proud of them. They're very critical to, uh, to our mission. All of our uh, C9, C130s are all Naval Reserve. Mm -hmm. But they're, you know, here's a reserve working with the Navy the regular Navy moving the carrier air wing. That same kind of teamwork between reserve and active duty forces made Naval Air Station New Orleans the premier air facility in the reserves. The Naval Air Station won the Conway Trophy for their outstanding safety record, not to mention a number of other reasons. Our supply department is at the top, uh, our MWR department, uh, the condition of the base, the professional reputation of the base, uh, the attitude of the men and women that, that, that work here are really all go in to the arrival at, uh, at who should win the Conway Trophy. It's just a symbol of, of how effective we've been. And the Navy Reserves have shown that type of success for the last 80 years. To those 104,000 plus reservists out there, as a commander of the Naval Reserve, I would want to say to them, thanks for service to, uh, to the Naval Reserve, thanks for service to uh, your Navy, but most of all, thanks for service to your nation. For Navy Marine Corps News, I'm Petty Officer Mark Kane. Well, training, whether it's being conducted by reservists or those of us on active duty, it's the cornerstone of high readiness. And for a group of Marines out in 29 Palms, California, it's daily training that guarantees they'll continue to be some of the quietest and deadliest Marines in the Corps. Quiet and deadly? They're scout snipers, and their job is a lot tougher than you might think. Looking out into the desert, you wouldn't hear or see them. But beware, you might be in the crosshairs of a scout sniper. The primary mission is to move in within 200 meters and get a shot off and to be able to egress without the enemy seeing you. And preparation is what makes the scout sniper's mission possible. First thing, I'm going to make sure I get uh, vegetated in enough in my natural environment. The ghillie suit itself breaks up the natural outline of the body, but you want to get colored in the environment that you're going to be in. The ghillie suit is what makes snipers invisible to their prey. It's made up from a mixture of netting, burlap, twigs, and mud. When you're uh, finished with it, you'll usually bury it for a couple days in the dirt, make it uh, smell like the environment and look more like the environment that you're going to be in. But the suit isn't the only thing that makes a sniper one with his surroundings. The way they move and the speed they move is also very essential to their survival. But it all depends on your cover. If you're in an open area where the enemy has an open view straight on you, you, you normally drop down into a low curl and move in inches, just like, just by moving your feet. The sniper has to be careful because on a day where there's no wind or cover noises, his movement might be noticed. And uh, every time you, you're moving, whether, whether it be day or night, you're as if you're moving as if 
the enemy is watching you and what he is. And uh, being so quiet, that just makes you want to move that much quieter. And you'll just, you'll just melt. Melting means just turning into the sand and you just go as low as you can go. Depending on the terrain and foliage, a sniper will try to get as close to his target as possible. I have about 186 meters. That's a cool story, being able to disappear like that and move quietly and everything else. Lots of training, I bet. Oh, a lot of training. They spend a lot of time out in the desert climatizing their bodies, mm -hmm. but they're just awesome to watch. Did you get to fire one of those rifles? I did, and it was, uh, I actually hit the target, if you can believe that. Ah, with your eyes open? With my eyes oh, open. Okay. Well, when we come back, we'll give you a few health tips on how to keep fat and cholesterol to a minimum in your daily diet. And Okinawa Marines head to the jungle for some of their own specialized training. Stay with us. A pitch to Carter and flashed it deep to left field, way back and gone. Oh, boy. Joe Carter's three-run homer to win the 1993 World Series was one of baseball's most dramatic moments. Becoming a professional baseball player took hard work, discipline, and a commitment to keeping my body healthy. That's why I never used tobacco. So listen to the pros. Quitting tobacco is one time that quitters always win. Welcome back to Navy Marine Corps News. Well, it's hard to watch TV these days without seeing your latest health hazard. That's right. Uh, unfortunately, the discussion always seems to focus on something that's rather important to all of us, food, specifically what's good for us and what we should try to stay away from. Petty Officer Jason Mitchell explains why all those burgers, fries, and onion rings aren't the perfect lunch. Uh. Darn. Cholesterol is a very important substance in our body. It is used for making cell walls and perform other essential functions. Now wait a minute. I get the feeling some of you aren't paying attention out there. Keeping control of your cholesterol level is simple. Diet and exercise. Great. Not in my Navy. Veggie. Grains. Good stuff. Watch your amount of saturated fat that you take in, things like butter and eggs and meat. Now, it doesn't mean you can never eat these things, but you want to try to eat a little bit less and maybe use some substitutions. Another is to exercise. Diet and exercise. would be anything that keeps your main muscles, like your leg muscles, moving continuously and get your heart rate up to a certain level. And the strength training would involve working out with weights. Keeping your cholesterol level in check with proper diet and exercise has visible results. Following this simple advice, you can reduce your chance for heart disease or heart attack. Petty Officer Jason Mitchell, Yokosuka, Japan. We're joined now by Lieutenant J.G. Paul Allen, a registered dietitian at the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Lieutenant Allen, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I like my hamburgers, my french fries. Uh, can I eat them and keep cholesterol down? You can still keep your hamburgers, Chief, but look at what's on that hamburger before you eat it. Okay. Look at the cheese, look at the hamburger itself, look at the extra sauces that are going to be put on there. Uh -huh. That's where you're going to find most of your fat and cholesterol. Okay. What about desserts? Do I need to forego desserts for fruits and veggies or what? Not necessarily. What I would say is choose your regular desserts more less, less mm -hmm. often. Your ice creams and your pies and cakes, okay. and choose fresh fruits more often. Okay. Now, will this work for sailors on ships? Do they have any way of knowing what nutrient content is out there? Sure. The galleys will post nutrient content of the food they serve on their line, mm -hmm. and if they don't, they can ask their MSs, hey, where's the nutrient content of the, of the food I'm eating? Okay, so you can still eat well, and you can still enjoy the food, but you can still keep your cholesterol down. You sure can. Okay, Lieutenant, thanks for joining us here. Thank you, Chief. All right, Chris, back to you. Thanks for that good info, Chief. As we saw earlier in the show, Marines are always on the lookout for realistic training opportunities. And as Marines in Okinawa demonstrate, that training definitely isn't restricted to the desert. Corporal Sean Barrio reports. 
Marines from various units around Ireland were at the Northern Training Area to work on combat skills such as patrolling, squad tactics, and land navigation. After a week or so of training, running the endurance course, and living in a bivouac, they were in for a unique chance to train. This would be the first assault of this type in the NTA. Two huts were built out in the middle of the jungle with no roads or trails leading to them. The quickest way, in or out, follow a creek. A group of five Marines was chosen to go in a few hours early and set up an enemy command post, later to be attacked and overrun by Marines practicing what they'd learned throughout the week. The aggressors set up flashbangs along the suspected route to alert them of the attack. It's a good opportunity to come out here, do some land nav, patrolling, and as he's doing now, setting up some flashbangs, uh, we got a patrol coming through and we're going to basically be the aggressive force to try to repel their assault. Once out to the site, they set up and waited for the patrolling Marines. In the attack on the command post, they could not destroy it because it was a simulated historical landmark, which meant the Marines could only sweep through and kill the aggressors. Well, the training we see here is... Uh... It's, it's good to go. I mean, uh, being uh, related closer to the wing than we are to the grunt field, uh, you'll get the chance to come out and do uh, like these squad tactics here and, and sweep and clear. And uh, it uh, makes you feel more like uh, what a Marine's supposed to be about. After the attack, the Marines regrouped, took a head count, and then it was in the hands of the instructors. They were critiqued on their performance and how well they did overall. Making mistakes at the NTA could save lives in combat. For Navy Marine Corps News, Marine Corporal Sean Barrio, Okinawa, Japan. Now that's some intense training, and I bet it makes them better prepared for deployments. It sure does, but Marines aren't the only ones for deployed. In March, the Theodore Roosevelt Battle Group got underway for a six-month deployment to the Mediterranean. They're relieving USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. And when these giant warships come or go from their tidewater home ports, Hampton Roads residents want to know what's going on. WVEC-TV, Norfolk's ABC affiliate, was on hand for the TR's emotional departure. Reporter Mike Gooding provides our focus on the fleet. And that about sums up the mood at Norfolk Naval Base as kids, moms, wives, and girlfriends say goodbye to the men of the Theodore Roosevelt Battle Group. So this is your first one, huh? It's pretty rough, isn't it? Yeah. What's the worst part? I just can't, I can't stand to see them go for six months. I just can't stand it. Pretty long time, isn't it? <laughs> It is the age-old ritual of the Navy. One carrier group ships out to relieve another that's already done its hitch. In this case, the Roosevelt Battle Group replacing the Eisenhowers. Well, you wonder whether they're going to come back, whether it could be all right. It's hard. I, 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 yeah, it really is hard sometimes. And it's harder on the kids, really. Goodbye, Daddy. I'll see you when I'm a year old. I'll be walking. With the goodbyes made, the ship heads forth to the Mediterranean Sea, where for once there's no particular crisis brewing, but there's still danger. There's always danger, and uh, if you look at the Mediterranean and uh, that whole area of the world, there's always uh, those things that are going on. But that's our mission, is to make sure that they don't erupt into war, and uh, we're ready to do that. The Soviet threat may be a thing of the past, and it may have been four years since the last war, yet the business of the United States Navy and the world's last superpower goes on. And for the 6,000 men of the Theodore Roosevelt and their loved ones, that means six more months away from home. Mike Gooding, 13 News, Norfolk. So sad, no matter how many times I see those emotional farewells, you know, you still kind of get choked up. Our thanks to reporter Mike Gooding and ABC affiliate WVEC-TV in Norfolk for providing our focus on the fleet. And when we come back, sailors and scientists are headed north for a mission under the sea. And the roads of Hawaii become the battlefield for Navy and Marine Corps runners in a test of endurance. Stay with us. 50 years ago, the Allies launched the invasion of Western Europe. D-Day was the first step to victory in Europe. I'm General Norman Schwarzkopf, a grateful nation remembers. 
Welcome back. The Navy and scientists have always worked together to unlock the mysteries of the sea. Now submariners are taking scientists under the sea to continue their studies of the world's oceans. USS Kavala, home ported in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, is planning a journey to the North Pole. Petty Officer Brian Kaiser reports. Kavala's trip onto the ice is a trip for science. The ship will embark seven scientists from the Naval Undersea Warfare Center and different universities. For the scientists, Kavala is an ideal platform for studying the polar ice. The beauty of using a nuclear submarine to do this is we can go wherever the scientists want us to go. Uh, we can get there uh, in a straight line, collecting data the entire time, and knowing exactly where we are the whole time we do it. Kavala will be under the ice for 45 days, and they plan to punch through the surface seven or eight times. For most of the crew, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I'm really excited about going. I mean, who can say they've actually set foot, foot on the North Pole? Not very many people. While under the ice, the scientists will be studying not only the water and the ice, but also the ocean floor under the polar ice cap. We're going to be collecting water samples. We're going to be taking physical oceanographic data. Uh, we're going to be taking geophysical data, that's bathymetry and, and gravity. The scientific community's knowledge of the Arctic Ocean is limited. The hope is these studies will provide new insights into ocean currents and the effects of global temperature changes. The ability of the submarine to collect a lot of data in a very short time will make this five-year program probably one of, of the major events in the history of Arctic exploration. While this is the best opportunity ever for scientists to study the ice cap, the sailors who will take them up there have plans to do some studies of their own. We're going to take our clubs up there, shoot a couple rounds, you know, be a different uh, aspect for the winter rules when we get out there. We got some Kavala golf balls and we're going to have the longest uh, drive contest and so you can hit a golf ball the farthest while we're at the North Pole. If you got a good hook, you might be able to get it to go around the world. Kavala's trip to the North Pole is a unique opportunity in many ways. But the trip is being made in the name of science and while this is nothing new for the Navy, it shows the public the Navy is not only working to defend the oceans, but also helping us to understand them. Petty Officer Brian Kaiser, Pearl Harbor. That looks like some really interesting research, but I wouldn't want to be up there in the North Pole. Too cold for me. Work on your golf game. You can have a little fun up there. It'll be no. something else. Uh, the April edition of All Hands Magazine, it's dedicated to helping us learn more about the world's oceans, uh, and it'll be hitting the streets real soon. Make sure to check that one out. And there's a sailor at Bethesda who will be hitting the books real soon. Uh, one sailor at the National Naval Medical Center is about to take a big step from hospital corpsman to doctor. But first, he'll have to endure four years of medical school. Petty Officer Bill Miles reports. Hospital corpsman third class, Kenneth Austin, is like many corpsmen right out of A school. He dreams of being a doctor. But Austin is making his dreams come true. Corpsman Simon Center, Petty Officer Austin, can I help you? He decided he wanted to be a doctor in his early teens when he hurt his knee and was treated by a physician who inspired him. And I was just uh, very much impressed with him and his demeanor. And uh, I said, hey, you know, I think that's what I like to do. I like to be able to help people and make their lives better. But his parents pushed engineering, and that was his field of study in college. Though he dropped out his senior year to follow a job opportunity, the dream of being a doctor soon got the best of him. And so you'll actually be doing that tonight. Mm -hmm. So he joined the Navy to make his dream come true. Taking courses when he could, he earned his degree and applied to medical school. He's been doing this for quite some time. He takes his education after hours, which is a difficult task for any sailor. When you couple the fact that he's working on a PM shift and has to sandwich his school around that, plus the curriculum for pre-med is not the easiest one on the planet, and he has done a terrific job with it. He's accepted to three medical schools. That says how hard he worked. Once I got accepted to uh, the medical schools, then it was a matter of making sure I was going to be able to finance it. And that's where the Navy came in. I submitted uh, the package for the Health Professional Scholarship Program. And actually, uh, it didn't initially go through as smoothly as you might think. He needed more recommendations, but he had enough time to get those and resubmit his package. 
then it was accepted, and now he's on his way to medical school. Being accepted to medical school, that make you proud? It makes me very proud. Um, it's, it's something that I've been working on for quite some time now. I hope that, uh, you know, I can be an inspiration for a number of people, not only uh, people uh, of my race, but also people in general. And uh, uh, yes, yes, it's, it's really a dream come true, and I'm, I'm very proud. I'm very proud. It's just encouraging because, you know, all of us have dreams. It just makes me want to just, you know, pursue my dream. Austin is the evening leading petty officer for nursing services and the Corman Assignment Center at the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. At any one time, there are 140 junior corpsmen that he's responsible for. The guy is nonstop. You know, he works hard. He's seen something that he wanted and he went after it. I, I couldn't be happier for him. The bad thing about it, I'm going to lose him as a hospital corpsman, but I'm going to gain a terrific position. A medical officer with the experiences of a hospital corpsman. How can you not help but be a terrific doctor? Petty Officer Bill Miles, Bethesda, Maryland. Being a doctor takes a lot of dedication, and it looks like Petty Officer Austin has a long road ahead of him. He sure does. Uh, and for some sailors and Marines in Hawaii, though, a long road is exactly what they're looking for. The Oahu Perimeter Relay Race. It's one of the longest races in the world. Petty Officer Brian Kaiser reports how these road-running sailors and Marines did on their grueling 134-mile course. At the start of the Oahu Perimeter Relay, the runner with number two on is just another guy in the group. But it won't take long for him to take the lead, and it's just a matter of holding out until the finish. Of course, the finish is another 130 miles away. The race starts late at night, so the runners can finish in daylight. Each team in the race has seven runners. There are more than 90 teams in the race, but many of them started earlier so that everyone could hopefully finish at the same time. The course is divided up into 35 legs, most of them between two and five miles, and after finishing a leg, the runners are driven to the start of the next leg that they'll run. It's crazy. You get no sleep. You're out there for 13, 14 hours, no sleep. Um, you know, it's lots of fun, though. Make no mistake, though, these guys may be having fun, but they're out here to win. Tomorrow will be the toughest. If you can make it through the night running, pretty and feel pretty good in the morning, you should feel really lucky. Each runner on the team will run about 20 miles apiece by the end of the race, but spreading those miles out over 13 hours is what makes the race nice. tough. Nice pace, nice pace. That was fun. Kind of the challenge of going all night is part of what drew these guys to the race. most difficult thing is, is if you look at your watch, it's, you know, 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning. And uh, I mean, who in the right mind is going to be out in the middle of the dark? Most of these places don't have street lights. You got cars whizzing by you at literally 80 miles an hour. And it poses a great challenge. As daylight breaks over the Waianae Mountains, the runners are covering the only part of the course that is unpaved, the trail around Kiana Point. For their own safety, the runners were held up on the other side of the point until daylight. Having been on the road for eight hours now, the faster teams are starting to catch the slower teams, causing things to bunch up at the handoff points. When we roll into these transition areas, the other teams look at us and they say, oh, number two, they must have started late. And then when they find out we started at 11 o'clock, they can't believe that we're already passing them. Some of these teams started three or four or five hours ahead of us. Yeah! 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 Number two. When the runners finally make it to the finish line, there are no big crowds or fanfare. But having conquered the course, these guys are satisfied with knowing they met the challenge. Petty Officer Brian Kaiser, Pearl Harbor. Chief, you ready to go? Uh, go where? Well, we're going to go do 134 miles now. <laughs> Tag team, right? Yeah. In a cab or something like that? In a cab. Ah, yeah, that's about the only way I could do it. Well, that's our show for this week. I'm Herb Josie. And I'm Christiana Halsey. Next week, we'll take you out to Quantico, Virginia, where Marines train for urban warfare. And then we'll go down to Patuxent River, Maryland, for an inside look at what it takes to conduct a search and rescue mission. We'll hope you'll join us for these stories and more. And we'd like to thank all our callers on the feedback line. You can call anytime, day or night, with your comments and suggestions. We'll leave you this week by visiting the Scout Snipers in 29 Palms, California, shot by Petty Officer Freddie Rodrigue and edited by Petty Officer John Charlton. Have a great week.